Good afternoon all, a very warm welcome to this afternoon's panel session here at Digital DNA 2021. My name's Emma Jones and I'll be the host for the next 40 or 45 minutes or so. Um, and when I'm not here presenting, um, I work with SecureWorks as a proactive cyber incident response consultant, essentially spending time with organisations across the UK, Europe, Middle East and Africa to build their cyber resilience and preparedness. So it's my pleasure to be here with a fantastic expert panel to talk all things ransomware. So I'll make a start with some key introductions. So I'll hand over to Doogie. Yeah. Okay, thank you. Dougie Grant, um, up until last month I was a Senior Incident Coordinator at the NCSE, as part of GCHQ, um, responsible for incident management of the most significant cyber incidents affecting the UK. Um, I'm currently, uh, as of this month, the Managing Director for Nihon Cyber Defence, they've just opened their Belfast office. Afternoon, I'm Laura Gillespie. I'm a partner in Pinsent Masons, a law firm literally just across the road. So I head the cyber team here in Northern Ireland and we help clients manage the legal uh, aspects of cyber incidents. Hello, and I'm Conrad Simpson. I'm a co-founder and director of Cypher. We're a, a locally based uh, cybersecurity services um, company um, uh, with offices here and in Glasgow and my uh, I'm also a lead uh, NCSA risk advisor in relation to government uh, cyber security. Uh, hi everyone, I'm David Crozier. Uh, I head up strategic partnerships at Queen's University Centre for Secure IT. Um, I'm also deputy director of the university's academic centre of excellence in cyber security education uh, programme. Um, I, on the side, I also advise uh, UK government uh, through the Cabinet Office and Department for Culture, Media and Sport on cybersecurity policy for the, for the UK. Perfect, thank you. So as we said earlier, we're here to talk about ransomware, but much more specifically around that debate that often is had at board level around to pay or not to pay that extortion demand that inevitably comes with those ransomware incidents. Now we know that ransomware has been around for a long time, so from around 1989, and we've seen various waves and iterations of that throughout um, the last three decades. But I think it's fair to say that more recently we've heard much more um, about it in the media um, with some high profile attacks and also regular reporting of victims publicly. So I think it's that that really has garnered everyone's attention and why it's so important to be here today to talk about those key questions that executives often need to you know, to have and to ask in those situations. So I think it's a good point to start with Doogie, particularly thinking of your background in the NCSC. So I wonder if you could talk to us a little bit about your th understanding of the threat and your experience of ransomware, particularly in the UK. Thank you, Emma. So, yes, I mean, ransomware has continued to evolve over the past decade. Um, it's evolved from the inconvenient screen locker to, to one of the most impactful, destructive cyber attacks that we've seen of late. And there's lots of different different types of cyber attack out there at the moment, particularly um, nation state activity, financially motivated cyber crime, online crime. But of the average of 800 to 1,000 incidents we dealt with in uh, NCSE and GCHQ every year, ransomware, the most prevalent type of attack they were seeing and the most impactive. And that wasn't just because of the impact on business and, and the um, the technical aspects, it was the reputational damage, it was customer confidence issues, it was the consequence management through the, the data exposure that we're seeing. And that be came about because of the way that ransomware has developed from that encryption tool to encryption and data exfiltration, and then encryption and data exfiltration and data exposure, and then it continues to evolve from that and different tactics being used by the actors. So it is a global problem. You know, statistics would say that over last year, $140 billion was um, the impact of, of ransomware across the globe. That's probably just a small proportion of what is actually out there. We see every 39 seconds a new ransomware incident being reported. So it is continuing to increase. It is continuing to be severely impactful against business industry, particularly in the UK. Now, is it opportunistic or is it targeted? Well, I would say it's actually both. 
we see sectors being targeted because of the real world stress effects we see on business and industry on sort of certain sectors using the education sector as an example we have seen three concerted targeted tax against the education sector in the UK in the past 12 months now why is that well the education sector I've been trying to get students back into school, they had problems with exams, they had problems releasing the results. And at those times of peak stress for the, the sector, we see the actors targeting those organisations involved in that because they think they can get the financial benefit. They think organisations have a more propensity to pay or higher propensity to pay. So we do see targeted attacks, but also opportunistic as well. So wide-scaled phishing, wide-scaled credential compromise, wide-scaled vulnerability exploitation, we continue to see that across a huge range of different organizations, certainly in the UK. But it is now not only a big impact on the business industry, but governments are now looking at this as a national security threat. And we see the International Ransomware Task Force that the UK is well involved in, and also the Home Office Sprint, as it's been called at the moment, to try and address all aspects of ransomware to reduce the impact in the UK. Well, that's the landscape we're seeing at the moment, and it's continuing to become a more challenging environment for us all. That's great, thank you. So, a question following on from that for you, Dugan, for the wider panel, in terms of the advice and guidance that's out there to try and counter and mitigate the, the ransomware attacks. Um, you know, welcome views um, of everyone. Is that guidance effective? Is it helpful? Um, what should we be thinking of um, as a priority in organisations? I think certainly in terms of the guidance that's there, um, I think sometimes businesses see it as a continuity issue and, and the decision they see it purely as a question of how do we ensure our business continues. But often I think certainly from my experience in dealing um, with businesses who are affected by these issues is that up until that point they perhaps have thought IT is an IT issue for the IT manager or the IT director and they assume that because someone is responsible for IT, therefore cybersecurity is also dealt with. And I think there is probably still some way to go to help with the education on what good cybersecurity actually looks like um, and what that means for each business. And of course, that will vary depending on, on what sort of information that the business has and, and how it manages it. But I think there is still probably some way to go in terms of the education of businesses around how they should manage good cybersecurity and what that looks like. Absolutely, fantastic, thank you. Conrad, David, any thoughts on, on guidance and effectiveness? I mean, the, the thing we would see certainly is that, that there's plenty of advice on, on the technical side of it out there, but people still fail to get the basics right. And, uh, you know, getting those basics right can really help reduce some of the threats out there. So organizations really just need to make sure that they're uh, aware of those threats and um, that they're looking at it from a business perspective and that they are going and, and fixing those uh, simple things like um, using multi-factor authentication on privileged accounts, on um, patching, reducing uh, vulnerable services across their network. Those are the sorts of things that need to be, uh, um, will help to reduce the impact. I, I, I think what Dougie has said is uh, correct, and, and Conrad, I, I think increasingly now as well is uh, actually th considering which systems to, to, to protect as well. You know, a, a lot of the attacks previously hitting things like the, the back office and the enterprise IT systems, increasingly we're seeing a lot of attacks now which are actually impacting on the operational technology side, um, where a lot of uh, those, you know, w what historically would have been uh, hidden away from, from internet access, things like SCADA systems uh, are now increasingly being brought onto IP networks um, and are, are, are actually very vulnerable uh, to attacks, so where it might not necessarily be uh, exchange servers or things like that that are hit. Increasingly, it's controllers that are controlling industrial control systems and, and the IP connected systems that, that, that interface between those and, and the office systems. Um, so, you know, it's not just an, an IT problem, there's also an OT problem there. Uh, we've seen, particularly with Colonial Pipeline and things, are you know, very highly, uh, were highly publicised where OT systems were attacked as well as IT systems. Perfect, thank you. I think the, the last point to make to that is some of the guidance we had about, you know, as we've heard, the IT security issues are very important, but the guidance needs to change now because of the other impacts of ransomware. And we need to look at the data mitigation aspects as well. So testing, exercising, planning for the technical issues, yes. Making sure your offline backups there, yes. 
but that doesn't actually help you with the data exposure aspect, which can be more damaging than the IT issues sometimes. So we need more effective guidance on how to deal with those data mitigation aspects. Perfect, thank you. And a great segue into the next question that I had for, particularly for you, Laura, um, around data breach mitigation um, and the sort of key risks that companies and organizations need to uh, respond to and mitigate going forward with these attacks. Sure. Thank you, Emma. Yeah, there's probably four key risks really arising from an incident um, that any business will face when, when a ransomware attack hits. The first is the regulatory risk that arises from it. And as, as Dougie said, um, we're, uh, data has been exfiltrated and exposed. Um, that obviously is a, is a key risk for the business in terms of either their customers, their um, employees, and that information is starting to appear, uh, could equally be confidential information. But from a regulatory perspective, of course, GDPR means that um, the no if there is a personal data breach that has to be notified to the ICO unless it's unlikely to uh, affect the individuals concerned, that has to happen within 72 hours. So there's always a pressure on to understand, is this a personal data breach? And if so, do we need to notify it? And we work very closely with, with uh, clients in order to perform that risk assessment and working with the forensic teams to actually understand the breach, understand what has happened and has there been exfiltration? If so, what sort of information is that and what is the risk that could present um, from that? So that's the regulatory risk. The second is the risk of claims. Um, we all remember the PPI adverts that were all over the newspapers. Um, someone in our sector will say privacy is the next big thing. Um, and. Uh, Vincent Mason's, um, the firm I work for, is involved in a case at the moment where they're awaiting a decision from the Supreme Court in a case called Lloyd and Google. And in that case, um, the question is whether or not a person can be compensated purely for the loss of control of their personal data. So they don't have to demonstrate harm, they don't have to demonstrate loss. Purely a loss of control could give rise to a risk of compensation. That may be a few hundred pounds. Multiply that by the 10,000, 20,000, 100,000 people affected and you've got a really expensive problem. So the claims risk that comes from these sorts of breaches is, is, is a real um, and present issue. And certainly a lot of the clients we work with, we're also working with insurers who obviously are, are covering these particular incidents. So the, the subject claim, I think, is a real issue. We're seeing lots of law firms. For some reason, they all seem to be based in Liverpool, but advertising, you know, when a breach happens, in 100% of the cases where we've seen an ICO fine under GDPR, there has been a mass action that's followed where people are looking for compensation as a result. Um, so claims is a real risk um, arising from that. And the trigger for that is that GDPR has a bit of a kicker which says if there's a high risk to the individuals arising from the incident, you must tell them. So it's almost like an open invitation then for the, for the claim to come. The third risk is around uh, customer confidence. So if you are having to notify people under your contractual terms, of course, they're concerned about whether they want to continue to do business with you. Um, that's a huge impact from a, from a business um, you know, reputation perspective. And that's the fourth, the PR angle that comes from it all. You know, we've seen, we've all seen the cases as they've appeared in, in the media and the PR aspect of that, again, it undermines customer or client confidence, and that's, that's a really significant issue for a business. So how do you manage those risks then? That's the big question. Um, the first, and, and you'll probably hear it several times today, is to ensure that businesses have an incident response plan. So figure out who's going to do what when it happens. And it's, I think, one question, certainly in my experience, and I've you know, been working in, in law for 20 years now, and with that, I think sometimes people still think this won't happen to them. And again, I'm sure all of us will say it will happen to most businesses. The only question is when. So having a clear plan as to who's going to do what, if it's ransomware and your systems are encrypted, making sure your incident response plan is offline so that it's not encrypted along with everything else. And then having the key stakeholders. So when an incident happens, I'm on the telephone with the insurers and the forensic team and the PR team and the business leaders, and we all collectively work together to ensure that in those hours and, and days that follow the event, um, we've got a, a clear plan of action as to what needs to happen. And as part of that, it will be ensuring that the incident is contained, so the information and the, the leak, if you like, or the, the issue is contained so far as it can be. If it's a restore from backup, that's been, that's been done. You know, we're clear that the threat actor is no longer um, able to get into the system and thereafter working through all the, the other risks that we've talked about to ensure they're dealt with. 
Perfect, thank you. So we've heard there a lot around the risk management and mitigation that happens once an incident hits and the organisation um, is responding. Um, but recognising that risk management is huge and it's extensive, um, are there recommended frameworks, are there recommended approaches that can uh, be taken you know, in advance of an incident particularly? Question for the panel. I think there's, there's, pl there's plenty of um, standards-based uh, advice out there, um, and you know, NCSC itself um, has a, a fantastic site in providing guidance across a whole range of subjects, including ransomware and the sorts of steps that need to be taken, both at a, an organisational and at a technical level. Um, but equally, you know, things like NIST in, in the States provides equally good. Uh, recommendations and uh, Google's a fantastic tool to uh, to, to find a, a, a dearth of advice around this. I think maybe distilling it down into what you need to do within your organisation is, is probably the bigger challenge. And, and so, first of all, understanding uh, what your exposure is and what those impacts are is probably the first stage in that process uh, to make sure that you put the right mitigations in place. Yeah. I think the other aspect is we're very good at looking at our, our asset management in relation to hardware, but we don't look at what data we're holding and what that data could, the consequence of the release of that data could be. Now, there's many incidents uh, I can think back on where it's not actually the, the system disruption has been the issue. It has been the consequence of the exposure of the data. And in some cases that has resulted in threat to life or risk to life to individuals. In some cases individuals have to move house or, or move occupations. In some cases they've been victims of fraud. Now, there's been a whole range of impacts and consequences, but initially knowing what data we're holding and the impact of the release of that data is vital. And that's one of the challenges we have, I think, in the early stages of the incident, which Laura referred to, is we need to get all these stakeholders together. We need to know what assets are affected, how can we recover, but also what are the impacts and consequences of this and plan ahead for that to make sure that we're not trying to do it at the time of, of, of the incident, but we know in advance what we hold and the impacts of it. Maybe if I, if I could just add to that, that it, it's relatively common for organizations to be able to understand what structured data they're holding. It's the unstructured data is, the, is where a lot of the challenges are. And if you've had a, a ransomware attack and data has been exfiltrated, if you don't understand what data you're holding within that unstructured data, it's very hard for you to then meet your legal compliance or understand whether you need to do something. So big push to get organizations to actually understand what data they hold across the piece. I think uh, what I would add is, uh, you know, Google's the last place you want to be going whenever you're in the teeth of an incident. So if, if you're Googling at 12 o'clock on a Friday night uh, after an incident, it's probably the wrong time. I think the critical thing as well is exercising. Um, I know uh, at CSET we have worked closely with a, with a large retail bank recently. Um, we have a cyber range facility down in, in Titanic Quarter. Uh, and we, we help them replicate part of their network uh, and model some of their systems uh, and introduce some ransomware into that network environment in a sandbox environment just to allow their staff to see how something like this can propagate across the, the, the actual systems that they use. Um, and, and that you know, was really eye-opening to them uh, that some of the, the tools and techniques that they had in place weren't sufficient to stop certain types of malware and that allowed them to then uh, go back to the real environment and actually implement uh, different strategies and techniques and tools. Um, so exercising, and I know we'll reference the NCSE website quite a lot, they're exercising a box and stuff like that. If you haven't looked at it, have a look at it, you know, show your top team uh, and just do some tabletop exercising around, well, what will we do, you know, so that everybody is well versed in, in what, what their role is um, whenever an incident takes place. That's great, thank you. So I think that really um, emphasises the need to firstly understand the threat and the risks associated with the threat and then to really prioritise the response, recognising sort of the complexities and extensiveness um, that faces organisations. So let's really get into what people want to hear about and is that whether organisations can pay, should they pay, what's the current advice and guidance. Um, so I'd like to come to you first, David, on the topic to sort of understand a little bit about that position. So the, the, the government guidelines and I, and I was frantically Googling this morning, uh, just doing my, swatting up and doing my homework. 
the government is a bit sketchy on this, uh, let's be honest. Uh, so the go UK government does not encourage, endorse, nor condone the payment of ransom demands, okay? Paying the ransom may constitute an offence under uh, the Proceeds of Crime Act, but based on a case in 2011, um, which was to do with actually paying ransoms to actual pir pirates, the, the, uh, <laughs> the Court of Appeal suggested that that might actually be legal. So, so the, the short answer is, it's a bit sketchy, but it's not technically illegal. Now, US states in particular and UK government are starting to look at, well, should this be made illegal? Um, and I think there's a general consensus that it probably should be made illegal. The big problem is, uh, and government and Dougie's been in the NCSE, uh, NCSE is whenever a company is, is in the teeth of an, uh, an incident, they're losing potentially millions then daily. The last thing they need is government coming down heavy handed and making things you know, a lot worse. So I think they're taking baby steps towards legislating against paying, but making sure that the appropriate support mechanisms, whether those are technical, whether they're fi financial, those need to be in place before they actually really you know, legislate for making it fully illegal to pay ransomware. And it, it is gonna be probably decades before we, we, we really get this, this licked. I think the, the main takeaway though is make sure that if it is gonna be your company that you can you know, recover systems quickly, that you can remediate and, and, and get things up and running again, that you're not losing business, that, that actually that you're in, you, your posture is such that you don't have, you're not in a position where you have to pay the ransom. You know, that's the worst case scenario. You know, plan ahead because at the moment the legislation is, is very much behind and the thinking is very much behind on whether uh, this should be illegal or not. I would just if I um, pick up from that, so we've had to, you know, advise from a, a legal perspective, protect specifically on that issue. And as um, David said, it's not illegal. Um, not always illegal to pay a ransom, but what you need to be careful of is there are sanctions, effectively legislation, which means that if, if money is paid to certain, certain organisations, it will be illegal. And also there can be circumstances where offences are created, where um, monies are paid, which would fund terrorism. So if a, if a ransom is being paid, checks at least have to be done to try and do due diligence, which seems like an odd concept to, to understand who the threat actor is, where is the money likely to be going? Because if those checks aren't um, carried out, then the organisation paying could themselves be guilty of a criminal offence. Um, and actually the, the Dutch um, government is presently looking at uh, making it illegal for insurers to pay ransom. So again, we often um, are working alongside insurers and their clients and insurance, insurance itself can be used to pay a ransom by some policies. Um, I think AXA, it was a couple of years ago, decided it wasn't going to fund them. They then themselves were hit by ransomware. So again, it's one of those, if you like, ethical questions, should it be permitted? But I had a conversation with one client recently and posed this question, what would your board do? And he said, all day long, I would pay the ransom because we couldn't afford not to. Our business would be dead in the water. We can't afford to be down for any longer than an hour or two. Um, so um, as David said, some organizations simply don't have the luxury of having that um, that choice and I think that's where there will be a kind of rub between well if we make it completely illegal and then if we completely disallow it what does that mean for the businesses um, because at the end of the day they still are the victim that you know it was the case that they should have had a better IT system the things they could have done better but at the end of the day they still are the victim of cyber crime so um, it's, it's a difficult question it, it is and, and there's you know a a, a grey area between that pure crime and, and terrorism and I think once you stray into the terrorism side it, then it becomes a really serious issue in terms of the sanctions and stuff. In terms of the, the, the payments, we know people are paying. Um, if you look at Darkside, you know, that were involved in the colonial uh, hack, you know, they, they got about $4.5 million. Now some of that money has since been recouped. Uh, but people who track a lot of the, the Bitcoin payments reckon that you know, prior to that, in the year prior to that, Darkside had got somewhere in the region of about $90 million from 47 uh, different events. You know, so it's still highly lucrative uh, in terms of the, the, the perpetrators. Uh, and, and you know, while some of that money can be, can be tracked down, while it's still so lucrative, 
it is going to be, you know, people are going to be attacked, uh, whether there's legislation there or not, because it's very, very difficult to prosecute once the money goes out of the country. And I think the other issue we all recognise that every time we make a payment, we are funding the criminal model and the criminal enterprise. So a payment, you know, on dark side, that means that they build their infrastructure, they increase their attacks, they make more complex ransomware. It, it does continue to build the criminal model, and that's a real challenge for us. Now, the old advice, which was just don't pay, that wasn't effective because of the reasons we've heard that businesses cannot operate. And saying don't pay is great, we don't have a business anymore. And that's why the government changed the advice to we don't encourage support to condone the payment of ransom demand. However, we recognise that it is a business decision. And in some cases, businesses in the private sector will make a payment. Now, on the public sector side, they are saying there will be no payment from any public sector. Public sector will not pay. That's a luxury that public sector have because they'll always be able to recover in some form and put finances into to rebuild and, and mitigate the impact of it. But we've got to recognise that the more we pay, the more we fund the criminal model, the more we increase the attacks. But at the same time, we cannot, certainly in my view, legislate for, for it's illegal to pay because we will see businesses failing, we'll see unemployment increasing, we'll see all the consequences of that. So a very difficult topical discussion. I suppose, I suppose one other point just to, to bring into that is that if you are, you know, as an organisation, um, you need to make the decision before it happens as to whether you're going to pay or not pay because it's not the decision you want to make uh, when you're actually over a barrel. Um, and so planning that is part of what you should be looking at in terms of those organisational plans for, um, for ransomware. And it's not only just whether you pay or not pay, but actually, when you're actually paying for that, what do you want back from the criminals? Um, so, obviously, you want the keys to, to actually decrypt your, your data. But you obviously, with this, the growth of these double extortions where they're exfiltrating data, you want your data back as well. And probably a third thing that you want to consider is information on how they got in in the first place, because you want to be able to close that door and make sure that you're not hit again, at least not from that particular vector. So um, consider those ma matters whenever you're actually putting your plan together. Just one final point on that. It was interesting that um, Uber was attacked a number of years ago and paid a ransom, didn't report the incident, to, including the ICO, and they were fined because the incident happened, but the ICO was very critical of the fact that um, they had paid the ransom, kept quiet, quiet about it for some time, and then laterally when it came to light, you know, that clearly was a point of criticism. So simply by paying the ransom will not negate your legal responsibilities in terms of reporting either to the ICO or to the, the subjects involved. So it will solve pr some problems, but not all. It's obviously a really complex space um, and hopefully um, a key message there, not just around preparedness, but is also around um, ensuring that business position, that corporate position in advance um, and ultimately not wanting to get to the stage where you actually have to make that decision. Because really, although it's for the executive um, members in the organisation, it's still quite a tactical, um, specific concept to work through. So I think that brings us really nicely on to understanding the future of the threat, the evolution um, and of course the importance of preparedness, um, which is a theme we've drawn upon throughout. Um, but I'd like to come to you, Conrad, for some sort of specifics in that space um, and how best organisations can take that advice forward. Well, I think, I think looking in terms of, unfortunately, ransomware is, a, a, is an existential threat now and, and isn't likely to go away for some time. So we do need to actually understand it better and, and put in place those plans to address it. I suppose looking to the future and, and, and what's happening with that, um, we're, we continue to see new extortion methods being used. So we've set up where we talked about uh, double extortion and triple extortion, where they add exfiltration and DDoS attacks on top of the encryption. Um, but where there are other methods being looked at where they're uh, auctioning data now to the highest bidder. Um, we're seeing the growth of things like AI-based uh, ransom fake or fake, deep fake ransomware where um, it's being used to create victims' uh, videos or pictures that would uh, put them in compromising positions and then ex either extorting money directly or uh, using that as a, a method to deliver a payload to the victim. Um, and I suppose 
taken up forward into potential use cases as we're seeing this growth uh, of effectively what is a, a criminal franchise business model where they're commoditizing the tools and using affiliates which are paid either commission based or on a salary base to do the attacking. Um, you know, the, the extension of that may be that we'll see, I know, scrupulous businesses uh, targeting their competitors by paying to have that work done through these ransomware as a service um, models or even internal users being bribed to deliver uh, ransomware into the internal network. Um, in terms of the actual ransomware code itself, I suppose we're seeing increased uh, detection evasion being built into that, automation, and I guess a gross more of uh, cross-platform capabilities. So it's not just Windows, but looking more across the other uh, uh, iOS uh, levels. And probably one that's, I guess, worrying to a lot of people is the, the uh, pivot into the cloud and what impact that may have going forward. So um, I think attacks where they're already seeing um, the ability maybe to embed uh, ransomware into container images or something like that will have a, a, a dramatic impact if that succeeds. Um, so those are some of the th my thoughts in terms of where it might be going. Um, I suppose in terms of the, the, the actual approach on this uh, for businesses, as we've already heard, planning is, is absolutely key, but the business needs to understand that it is a business risk. They need to look at those legal and regulatory obligations. They need to understand where those information assets are being stored and without knowing where they are, you can't protect them. Um, you need to look at whether you have insurance in place and, and what that will cover. Um, you need to make those pay, no pay decisions um, uh, up front and maybe again look at what other resources you're going to need if you do get impacted to. Do you need to have specialist legal counsel or expert uh, technical advice ag agreed or in line in advance of this happening? Because when it hits, you're not going to have the luxury of running around trying to, to find those resources at that point. That's great. Thank you. Um, sorry, David. I was just going to add uh, to some of the, the sort of evolving threats, uh, certainly at CESA, two of the things that we are looking at closely, software-defined networking as a new uh, attack factor, and also hardware-based Trojans as well, um, introduced at sort of chip level. How do you detect those, you know, because you're, you're not using traditional software techniques to detect those Trojans, so very much looking at supply chain security uh, in hardware, uh, and how do we detect those uh, as well. So those are two of the evolving areas we're researching at the moment. So we mentioned earlier a little bit sort of to supplement those incident response plans and that crisis management from across the business. Um, sort of the view on exercising then and whether we think that will become more of a requirement, whether it's through the regulators or through sort of recommended forums such as this, open to the panel. I think exercising um, it has to come to the fore and I think many cyber insurers will be looking not only having a cyber insurance response plan but making sure that's tested exercise and as Laura said everyone knows how to, to get it at the opportune time. So exercising as we're all aware is a key response in the preparedness to ransomware attack and the organisations that recover more effectively from ransomware attacks are those organisations that have planned and exercised. The organisations that haven't done it we see them failing and they, they are unable to recover and they have catastrophic consequences. So not only in the insurers, but also in the accreditation for some government services as well, I think we can see coming more to the fore. Um, we see more and more talk of that, that we have to prepare more for these attacks. And we saw it you know, with cyber essentials in a very basic aspect. You, to, to tender for some government work now, you must be cyber essential. However, in the future, you're also going to have to potentially show that you have planned and prepared and exercised for a ransomware attack or supply chain attack to reduce the impact on critical national infrastructure or other essential services. Okay, S sorry. Sorry, I was just going to say, and uh, not, it's not only just exercising, I think, incident response plans, but one factor we haven't talked about is people and, and staff. And I think that it's important to, you know, obviously there's an ongoing requirement for training of staff in, in terms of how do they spot ransomware, who do they contact and what do they do whenever they actually are sure that there is an incident. But with them as well, there's a, a requirement for on, 
for them to be exercised. So, you know, fishing um, exercises that can be done internally can identify people who perhaps need some additional training. And um, you can look at innovative ways to actually ensure that that link in the chain is certainly stronger. I know I did some work with, with uh, Bank of England. They were um, came up with some very innovative ways of, of trying to get people involved, everything from uh, sweets on the desk to uh, um, putting in, in place uh, a school internally to actually take them, uh, them through how they actually would spot uh, ransomware, etc. So, great. key element. So it's about that traditional people, process, technology, and remembering that, I suppose, um, you can have controls, plans, but that wide consideration um, and remembering that technology is not necessarily the silver bullet. It's about working um, in all those respective areas. So if I could ask the panel to share one piece of advice, so one takeaway for everyone here today, um, what would it be? Um, and I'll come to you first, David. I, I think we, we've just covered it. I think it's exercising, you know, that people you know, have that muscle memory uh, of, of what they do whenever a, an event takes place, that they just kick into gear automatically and they know what their role is, what, uh, what uh, each team member's role is, who they need to speak to, that those, uh, those plans are, are offline somewhere so that they can be pulled out quickly and they know exactly who, who to communicate with, who, who needs to take what action. I'm not exercising, but exercise over you know, an hour or two isn't sufficient, that they know, you know, they're in for the long haul, you know, that, that this could be days um, and that people are prepared for that, you know. So exercise, 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 and, and, and that muscle memory will kick in whenever, whenever they're hit. Perfect. Thank you. Conrad? I, I'll stick with a the technical theme and, and say, I, I think as I said earlier, getting the basics right is, is fundamental. But equally, I think uh, evaluating the currency of your defences because these threats are evolving and uh, it's not good enough to just put in some technology and leave that there for years hoping that that's going to cut the mustard. It won't. Um, you need to look at new technologies that are coming up to defend your network and ensure that you've got the, the right protection in place. Absolutely. Laura? Uh, well, we've talked already about incident planning. I think that something we all kind of recognize as being crucial. But the other thing I would say is privacy by design. It's this slightly nerdy concept, if you like, within GDPR. But it, the concept is that you build privacy into everything that the organization does. So think about your system controls. As Doug said, think about what is held where. Because if you've got your asset register, then already you're two steps ahead of, of many others because you know what, you know, if, depending on which server's impacted, what information is in scope. Um, system segregation, don't put all the really juicy stuff in one place um, or across the system so that, you know, it's, it's kind of, if the whole system is affected, then uh, you've got an issue. So think about what you hold and where you hold it so that if you are hit by ransomware, you at least then minimise the damage as a result. Thank you. I think they've all gone now, but um, <laughs> I, I suppose my only one, and, and just to expand on what others have said, is identify who your stakeholders are, who's your support, who are you going to go to to ask for help when it happens at six o'clock on a Friday night, because you will not be able to find the right people at the right time, and it's the wrong time to start looking for that help. So as part of your response plan and your exercising and your privacy by design and everything else, your technical solutions, make sure you know who you're going to contact to get that support and engage with them before the incident strikes. Brilliant, thank you. Okay, so we've covered a lot of content in the last 40 minutes or so, um, but of course ransomware remains the number one threat to business and industry today, and I'm sure we all agree that we don't expect that position to change going forward. Now in terms of that question to pay or not to pay, um, and we mentioned earlier that that's much more tactical, well actually we don't want to be answering that question, right? We want to be posing the strategic question to all organisations about how you can best prepare in order to respond to the inevitable cyber attack. And that brings us to a close today. Thanks to our fabulous panel for all the commentary and discussion. Um, and we hope to catch up with everyone later throughout the event. Thanks for your time.